<laughs> okay. I don't need that. Oh. Yeah. Oh, oops. <laughs> Ooh, do man. This one? Okay. I don't know. What, what are you looking for? Okay. Here it is. Great. So, um, for the last uh, talk in this session, we're going to switch focus a little bit to, to wireless security. So, Yun Long uh, is a fourth year PhD at Nanjing University, and he's going to uh, tell us about some eavesdropping attacks and defenses in wireless networks. Okay. Thanks for the introduction. And it's my pleasure to have a presentation here. The title of, of our paper is Diming Downlink Leakage from Training Sequence in Multi-User Memo Networks. And my name is Yun Long Mao. And this is joint work with Dr. Yuan Zhang and Professor Sheng Zhong. Uh, all of the authors are from the Department of, of Computer Science and Technology of Nanjing University, which is located in Nanjing, China. OK. And this is my outline. First, we will have a brief review of multi-user memo networks, including some notations like CSI, beamforming, and training sequence. Then we will talk about our attack model, and I will introduce a, an illustration of a new eavesdropping attack in time division duplex system. After that, I will introduce uh, our secure CSI estimation scheme to secure the downlink of mobile users. And last, I will show the performance of our proposed scheme and some experimental results will be talked about. Okay, let's begin with the CSI. And as we all know, when mobile user communicates with the base station, uh, the signal between the transmitter and the receiver is always interfered. The interference can be caused by uh, various factors such as multipath propagation, selective fading, and additional noise, and so on. Uh, the figure here shows the situation of multipath propagation. Uh, the signal sent from the base station can reach mobile user by the path of sight and the reflection of buildings and the ground. And the physical channel properties like multipath propagation between the, the transmitter and the receiver are called channel state information, aka CSI, which can describe how the signal is affected by the channel. And if the CSI between the base station and the mobile user is known, uh, the communication between them can be more efficient. Uh, let's say the base station wants to serve mobile user MS1, and then the base station will uh, adjust its transmitting parameter according to MS1 CSI. And when there is another mobile user, let's say as MS2, and the base station wants to serve MS2, then the base station has to change its uh, transmitting parameter according to the CSI of, of MS2. So what if we want to serve them at the same time? Then another antenna is needed for the base station. The base station has to coordinate two antennas so that the transmitting parameters can be corresponding to both M1 CSI and M2 MS2 CSI. And based on zero forcing beam forming method, uh, the messages for MS1 and MS2 should be encoded into two sample streams, X1 and X2. Zero forcing beam forming uh, is very simple. The basic idea is to pre-code messages with converse CSI, and zero forcing beamforming is widely used because of its uh, precision and simplicity. And then X1 and X2 are sent from two antennas, respectively. The assumption is that the base station should know uh, CSI between all transmitters and the receivers. Okay, in ideal situation, the base station knows perfect CSI, and MS1 can receive a message one without the realizing of the existence of a message two. And as for MS2, uh, he can receive message two without the interference of message one. But this ideal situation will not happen in real world 
because there is no way for the base station to know perfect CSI between all transmitters and the receivers. So to achieve this, uh, to approach this ideal situation, many uh, CSI estimating and pre-coding methods have been proposed. And the CSI has been one of the most important factors in multi-user MIMO networks. Then uh, the next question is how to get accurate CSI? Well, CSI is changing rapidly. The most powerful uh, method is to use training sequence. Before transmitting actual payload, the base station and the mobile users use publicly known training sequence as a reference to estimate CSI between them. Then what is training sequence and why do we need it? Uh, to use uh, zero forcing beamforming to encode messages, we need CSI. And in order to get accurate CSI, we need to insert commonly known sequence into the transmitting. And we will estimate CSI based on the changing of that sequence. So that sequence commonly known is usually called training sequence. Okay, in uh, Shen's press work, uh, they have proposed a uh, eavesdropping attack based on CSI feedback. And this attack is feasible because uh, mobile users will send their CSI back to the base station. And so malicious user will have opportunity to forge his uh, CSI report to mislead the base station to transmit other users' download to the malicious user. So what if there is no CSI feedback? And actually, it is not always necessary for mobile users to send the CSI back in explicit form. According to the reciprocity of various channel, the mobile users can just send the training sequence to the base station, and the base station will uh, estimate its CSI at the transmitter by estimating the CSI at its receiver. And this is called uh, implicit CSI estimation. Implicit CSI estimation has many advantages. Uh, for example, the communication complexity is lower than the explicit CSI estimation, and the base the base station performs estimating process. This will save the energy for mobile users. And there is no delay from estimating CSI to using CSI. And as shown in this figure, there is only one way trip from mobile users to the base station. So malicious user has no chance to, no, no chance to forge its uh, CSI report. That means the previous attack does, does not work in implicit CSI estimation because malicious user cannot mislead the base station. But based on our observation, it is a malicious user is still able to eavesdrop on other users' download by transforming his training sequence before the base station performs uh, estimation. And now let, let me explain how to do this. In normal case, uh, Mobile user, let's say MS1, should transmit original training sequence X to the base station. And the base station will use X prime, which it received, and the original sequence X to estimate the CSI between the base station and MS1. But when there is a malicious user, let's say MS2, who wants to eavesdrop on MS1, then MS2 should uh, eavesdrop on the base station first and estimate uh, MS1 CSI H1, and based on the H1 and the MS2's own uh, CSI H2, MS2 can calculate his expected CSI H prime. Then MS2 calculates uh, the complement of uh, delta H of uh, his expected uh, CSI H prime, and based on the delta H the MS2 is able to falsify his training sequence as delta HX. But the base station still takes MS2's training sequence as original sequence X and estimate MS2 CSI as uh, H2 prime. When the base station uses H2 prime to decode its signal, in fact, the base station has already uh, mixed uh, M1, MS1's download to MS2. When MS2 receives its download component, MS2 can use interference cancellation method to decode MS1's download. 
And we should note this attack is very hard to deal with because uh, this attack is easy to perform. Uh, training sequence and CSI are in plain text and the whole estimating procedure is a linear system. And on the other hand, this attack is hard to be identified and prevent. The original training sequence is based on op operation and there is no evidence for the base station to tell who is using forged training sequence. And another episode is uh, the estimating interval is very short, so we cannot use some heavy protocols to secure this procedure. To secure the, uh, the downlink of mobile user, we have proposed a secure C uh, CSI estimation, and the basic scheme consists of two phases. First phase is generating commitments, and in this phase, all mobile users should generate a commitment about their own training sequence, and that the, uh, the base station would use for estimation. And the second phase is revealing commitment. After the base station has hold commitments for one coherent interval, and mobile users will review their training sequence to the base station, so that the base station could do CSA estimation with the training sequence that mobile users have committed about. Now let's see some details. Uh, in first phase, there are two steps. The first step is to generate commitment. And in this step, we take use of a fuzzy commitment scheme proposed uh, by Jules and Wittenberg. And the verification process of this fuzzy commitment scheme is very efficient. And also a linear error correcting code is needed. The generation of training sequence and commitment is very straightforward. Uh, all, uh, every, every mobile user randomly choose his uh, training sequence R and the code word C, which is used to encode R for the commitment. After that, mobile users should insert their commitment into upload. And if this user is a, a new user, uh, he should keep be a uh, back off for other users upload. And otherwise, mobile users can just insert their commitment into a fixed position of the upload. For example, we insert the commitments to the upload in the front of, of the upload. And one important thing to note is that the uh, training sequence mobile users have committed about is to be used in next coherence interval. And this arrangement can make sure that all mobile users will use the training sequence uh, only they have committed about. And uh, mobile users cannot know other users' training sequence beforehand. So after, uh, as for the base station, the base station should keep collecting commitments inserted in the upload until the first phase ends. Once the first phase ends, uh, the base station should require for a reviewing message immediately. And this is the second phase. Uh, in second phase, uh, uh, based on our need, we let the fuzzy commitment scheme work in this way. Uh, the base station receive our prime as reviewing messages, and the base station use these reviewing messages to verify the commitment. If the, com uh, the ver if the verification process passes, then the base station use R prime and the original training sequence R, which is recovered from R prime, to estimate CSI between all between the base station and all mobile users. Uh, with all mobile users CSI estimated, the base station can update his codebook and use new CSI to encode its signal. The security of this scheme is based on the observation that CSI is changing rapidly along with the changing of time or uh, spatial position. And uh, when the mobile users uh, make a commitment of their training sequence in the first phase, in fact, they have provided uh, evidence for the base station to tell who is cheating in the next interval. And uh, although the all mobile users will review their training sequence in the second phase, and the malicious user will know uh, other users' CSI, but this does not matter because 
uh, if malicious user wants to take use of this CSI, he has to wait for next commitment phase. And by then, all mobile users' CSI and the training sequence have already changed. Okay, and this is the phase one and phase two. The relationship uh, between them in the timeline. We insert commitment in the front of upload. And if any user is a new user, he should wait for one coherence interval because there is no available CSI at the base station for him yet. And once the first phase ends, all mobile users should submit their reviewing message immediately. Uh, and uh, in some cases, we cannot, we cannot guarantee that uh, CSI is changing as rapidly as we need. Then how we, what can we do with this problem? Um, uh, because our secure CSI estimation is based on instant, instantaneous CSI, and when CSI keeps unchanged or changes very slowly, the similarity between current CSI and the previous interval CSI will make malicious user able to launch eavesdropping attack. And how do we do, how, how can we uh, prevent this? Uh, this is reasonable because there is always a trade-off between sec the security and the, the transmitting rate. Stable CSI can contribute to high communication rate. Uh, this is because uh, a stable CSI requires less uh, CSI estimation and has longer coherence transmitting time. Uh, on the other hand, a stable CSI is very easy to be predicted, so the malicious user can take use of, th of this opportunity. Recall that uh, there are two steps for malicious user to launch eavesdropping attack. The first step is to lead the base station to transmit other users' download to the malicious user, and this can be achieved by transforming his own chain sequence. And the second step is the uh, malicious user should cancel the interference caused by the channel and his own download uh, to review the target's download. Uh, we can stop the first step in instantaneous CSI case, but as for the relatively statistical CSI, we have to uh, prevent the attacker in the second step. Uh, aiming at the second step, we have proposed an adaptive security scheme. And the adaptive security scheme, the basic idea is very easy. Uh, based on the interference cancel cancellation method, uh, malicious users uh, download message must be known to himself. But if we insert proper bit arrows into all download of all mo mobile users, then the interference cancellation process will be disturbed by accumulated uh, arrows. So uh, to uh, accomplish this, uh, the base station should calculate how much higher the SNR of changing CSI is than the threshold we choose. And the base station, based on that result, the base station can solve how many bit arrows are needed to insert to download. Uh, finally, the base station can add artificial bit arrows into its transmitting queue by his calculation. And the last step is to in inter integrate this adaptive security scheme into our secure CSI estimation, and which is uh, very easy because the secure CSI estimation happens before the base station encodes message, and the adaptive security scheme will happen well, the coding process. Okay, and we have implement we have implemented uh, our uh, secure CSI estimation and adaptive security scheme uh, for a mobile user for multi-user memory networks uh, in time division uh, time division deplex system. Uh, the hardware we use is USRP N two hundred series and OCTO clock to provide the PPIs and the switch, uh, the gigabit switch and the cable. Uh, of course, there are two laptops to control experiments and collect uh, uh, data, which are not shown here. 
As for the software, we mainly use GNU Radio Development Kit. And if you are interested in the detailed implementation, please uh, see our, work, our paper. I want to show the first result is how the eavesdropping attack can be achieved. We measure the eavesdropping with uh, our security CSI estimation and without it. And one observation is uh, it's always very important for malicious user to choose his uh, forged CSI. And uh, in, in any case, malicious user can guess um, uh, other user's message bit by bit. But if we apply our secure CSI estimation, when malicious user wants to guess one bit, he has to guess other bits at the same time. That's why uh, our scheme has higher BR than, uh, has a lower BR than conventional uh, schemes. And when we apply our adaptive security scheme, we want to know how much we should lost the bandwidth, how much we should lost to trade for uh, the security. And the answer is in this figure. And we can see uh, even if the CSMSC is 10 to the power of minus three, uh, we can still have acceptable the bandwidth loss as long as we choose a reasonable uh, threshold. And we, uh, we, we recommend to choose the uh, SNR threshold uh, as two. And uh, in most cases, the bandwidth loss will be less than uh, 10%. Okay, uh, to, uh, to the performance concern, we have, we have also measured the overhead of our scheme. As for the first phase, uh, most work is done by, Malaysia, by mobile users uh, while downloading and waiting. Uh, so we mainly uh, uh, measure the uh, co computation process of the base station. And we can see in this figure, the most expensive operation is in reviewing a fit interval. This is because uh, the base station has to uh, verify the commitment of mobile users and estimate the CSI of them in single thread. We do not apply any multi-thread uh, programming method, but this result is good enough. If you have some equipment or, uh, which, is, which work on uh, gigahertz, you will have the whole procedure done in microseconds. Okay, in this talk, we know that malicious user in, uh, in multi-user memo networks can use drop on other users download by transforming his training sequence. And to, uh, prevent, thi to prevent this, we have proposed a security CSI estimation to stop a malicious user from downloading other users' message. And this game is based on CSI's rapid changing. When the CSI keeps unchanged or changes very slowly, we will use adaptive uh, security scheme to prevent malicious user from decoding other users' message. And these two components together will construct our final countermeasure. And that's all for my talk. Thank you very much. All right, so uh, we have time for some questions. Yeah, my question is, do you consider one eavesdropper or you may have more than one and what about colluding eavesdroppers in this system? Uh, excuse me, what is the proper? The I mean, yeah, what's the attack model? Do you consider only one eavesdropper among those mobile users or yeah. you may have more than one and yeah. Whether we, there is a collusion yeah, potentially we, between them or not? We, we just cons can cons consider one malicious user and we do not consider the uh, conclusion situ uh, uh, situation. And I think uh, for the interference, the interference cancellation method, the malicious user can always uh, uh, review other users' message by uh, cancel the interference. Uh, this method uh, is not, uh, is not re uh, limited to the number of users. This is a, 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 re uh, a general method to decode other users' ma uh, message. But as for uh, the attacker, we just consider one malicious user. Yeah. 
So my next question is about the timing of these two phases. Timing so of two, two phases? Of these two yeah. phases. So if you have a new users, they have mm. to wait until yeah. the two phases finish and then they can start or they can talk to the base station or, I mean, don't you think that this is a limitation and there, there, there is a delay that's coming behind mm, that? No, because the, uh, the interval is very short and it has to wait for one uh, coherence interval. This is, uh, this is reasonable and even in a uh, conventional uh, scheme, it, there is also a, a, a waiting time for new user because the base station should put this user into the waiting line and have some arrangement about the uh, encoding so that they can talk to each other. But I think the upload is open. You can uh, upload your message, but the base station can only transmit to you for your download uh, when the guard interval passed. So I, I have a follow-up question. So uh, I, it wasn't very clear. What is your threat model here? So what, what, what do you, what, what cap capabilities do you expect the attacker has? Mm -hmm. The attacker is just uh, uh, like a normal mobile user. Uh, it does not have additional uh, ability, but it has, uh, it ha must have some equipment to eavesdrop to eavesdrop on mobile users, to eavesdrop on base station. That's his uh, addition. Right, but you assume that there's no encryption at a higher level in the protocol? Mm, it is not a specific uh, condition. Uh, as long as the mo malicious user can eavesdrop on other on mobile user, uh, it's OK to launch this eavesdropping attack. Uh, right, right, but the point is that if um, I mean, if I can encrypt at a higher level in the mm. protocol, mm. why would I? Uh, yeah. Why would I try to add security at the at the wireless level? Yeah, I see. That's the difference between the f uh, physical layer security and the application layer security. And I think this question is mm, this question is difficult to answer because uh, when you have some application layer security, in you are still uh, faced with chosen a chosen text attack or some other attack uh, aiming at the application layer security but uh, as for the physical layer security we sometimes want to have physical layer security so that we can trust the physical layer and have some plain text to transmit it for uh, for the command or for the control sequence uh, so that this is uh, Physical layer security. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one more question. Yeah. This was just a comment on on your observation. Uh, the fact um, the physical layer security is interesting in the sense that you can get it for free in quotes without the costs of having, for example, to distribute keys or SSL user certificates at the application layer. At the same time, uh, my observation is that the physical layer security community tends to make um, assumptions about how evil the bad guy is and, for example, assume that there's just one or two mm -hmm. bad guys that and uh, that um, you can actually estimate the channel states to all the bad guys so that you can construct your message to the good guy in a way that the bad guys cannot read it. But on this computer security side, we tend to make the assumption that the bad guys are innumerable, that there are a lot of them. Mm -hmm. So it's difficult to estimate channel states for all the bad guys. So to have this, this nice security property is not always easy, also to f at the physical yes. layer. Yes, 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 thank you very much. Cool, thanks for the clarification. And on that note, we are closing the most awesome session of the conference. So let's give the speaker another round.